Welcome back to Tour Guide Tell All with Canon, Becca, and Rebecca coming at you live and in color, which is not true because we are not live and this is a podcast. So we are still in our respective homes and we are ever so grateful for the great feedback about our podcast. We want to give a shout out to our patrons. We literally cannot do this without you. Your support paid for the ProZoom account that allows us to go over 40 minutes. Believe it or not, April is over, and this May 2020 is the 75th anniversary of VE Day on May 8th, which is also Becca's birthday, so please give her some birthday love and give her five-star reviews. All month long, we'll be focusing on World War II on our podcast, virtual tour content over at Free Tours by Foot on Instagram, Facebook, and more. So today, Becca is going to be talking about President Truman, whose birthday is also May 8th. May 8th, 1945 was only a few weeks into his presidency, so victory in Europe is a pretty awesome birthday present. So there's no Truman Memorial in Washington, D.C., and with the exception of some versions of our White House tours, we don't always get a chance to talk about him. Well, I think that Harry S. Truman, in addition to sharing my birthday, which is very significant historically, uh, (laughs) is really an underappreciated president. Um, I think that as we talk today, we're going to see that he was really the end of an era or the last of his kind, sort of the citizen president. Um, He sort of is going to be just before the cusp of the celebrity that's going to start to become associated more and more with the office. Um, Also, I do talk about Truman on some of my tours. Um, I don't know if you do too, Rebecca. I talk about him on my White House at Night tour scandalously and other tour guides laugh when I say I talk about him on a scandal tour but hopefully listeners you will understand why so I find him really interesting I'm really excited to talk about him are you excited Rebecca I really really am so let's start with the number one question do you know what the s in Harry S Truman stands for I, I do yes and it stands for nothing Nothing. It stands for nothing. Um, Truman will tell people later that the S was a compromise. He had two grandfathers, Anderson Ship Truman and then Solomon Young. And so the S just gets sort of thrown in there. But he tells reporters over and over in his lifetime to not put the period after the S because it does not actually stand for any one name. So people will joke that the S stands for nothing. Um, But that's what the S in Harry S. Truman's about. And also he's hairy. As well. He's not Henry or anything more official. He's Harry Truman. Yeah, he is Harry Truman. It is not like a, a nickname. No. Um, so that's great. He is Harry. He comes from very humble background. He's from Missouri. Um, he ha- comes with kind of this farming background, very Midwest, wholesome, all-American, but not very wealthy. Um, his entire life is going to be sort of this trying to lift yourself up by your bootstraps, but getting knocked down a lot. Uh, It takes him a long time to find career success and to find financial stability. Um, He's deeply intelligent. He (laughs) reminds me of you, Rebecca, because he's like an obsessive reader. He reads everything all the time. He loves history. And he loves music, which I think is really cute. If you look at these pictures of young Harry S. Truman with his little glasses, and you usually see him at a piano. He really, really loved music. He gets into a habit when he's a kid of getting up at 5 a.m. So he can practice piano for an hour or two every morning, um, which is crazy to me to think that a child would do that of their own accord. But he does. And he becomes a pretty exceptionally skilled player by the time he's about 15. And he'll play piano for the rest of his life. I'm just going to say 5 a.m. <laughs> is not, if that's what it takes to make it in this world, I'm never going to be president because that's, <laughs> I can't remember the last time I saw 5 a.m. <laughs> you can imagine though, it makes him stand out when he does eventually come to Washington, D.C., where these men have a habit of late nights and, and partying and, you know, debauchery and Truman's getting up every morning at 5 a.m. He's ready to work. All the other, all the other congressmen sort of sleeping it off. Um, I'm so sure I don't know what you mean. <laughs> he's an unusual type. 
um, because of his upbringing. He's going to graduate from high school in 1901, so like the dawn of the 20th century. He will try to go to business school. Uh, that's not going to work out for him. It's too expensive. He leaves to focus on working. He's going to try to go back to school several times. He'll try law school. He'll actually get like an honorary law degree, law certificate later. But he is, interestingly, the only president since William McKinley to not have a college degree. And he's our last president chronologically to have not graduated college. So I think he really does represent this sort of um, different kind of path to the presidency, not the Ivy League school, uh, not the sort of celebrated military hero that we might think of. Uh, speaking of the military, though, that's going to be Truman's kind of way out of this hard scrabble life. Um, he's going to get into a military career. He tried to go to West Point uh, because West Point at the time did not require any tuition. So he tried to get an appointment to West Point and uh, he had terrible eyesight. So they said no. Uh, so he was like, okay, I guess I'll join the National Guard. But you still have to take the eye exam to join the National Guard. And he was like, well, how am I gonna get around this? So he memorized the eye chart. He got a buddy to tell him what it was. He wrote it down and he memorized it. So when he could go in, he passed it on the second attempt, thanks to memorizing it. I love that detail. I just, that says so much about like his ingenuity and his, the desire to serve. I just love that little detail. The desire to serve for sure. I think, I mean, he gets into the military for practical reasons. It's an opportunity to network, to advance, to make some money, some, some sort of money to come in. But he does it because he wants to serve his country, wants to serve his community. He's a Missouri boy through and through. Um, a lot of his jobs will connect to the community. So I love that line. Uh, to pass the eye exam. Now, on um, the time that he joins the National Guard, 1905 to 1911, um, with Battery B, but then when World War I kicks off, when the United States joins World War I, he's going to rejoin Battery B and get back into the service. So he had started to get out. He was trying uh, his hand at different businesses, but when World War I starts, he is all in. So he rejoins Battery B. He's a a crack recruiter because he's such a natural born kind of politician. He's a hobnobber. He, people like him. Uh, they like him so much. They elect him. They choose him to be their first lieutenant. He's in charge of running the Camp Canteen at Fort Sill. That's where he's stationed in Oklahoma. Canteens were not money makers. Usually canteens were like a bunch of soldiers put in a couple bucks and that money was used to buy the goods that they would need to survive at the fort. They were usually, you know, just a way to make bulk orders. But Truman partners up with a buddy of his who ran a clothing store back in Missouri, and they actually made a serious profit running this canteen. Most of the soldiers got back their $2 investment within six months, and the canteen paid out $10,000 in dividends. So this was like the most profitable canteen in the history of the United States Army up to this point. This might also be Truman's most successful business endeavor. As we talk more, we're going to see that making money was not something Truman was very good at. No, no, he was not a, uh, not a titan of industry, Harry Truman. So as much fun as he's having in Missouri and then Oklahoma, he really does want to go fight in Europe, and he's going to get his chance to go over. He'll be promoted to captain of a new battery, Battery D. Uh, this was known as being a particularly unruly outfit. Um, they were not very disciplined. They did not take well to being commanded by Truman. Uh, they felt maybe that he was, uh, he seemed at first to be a little bit of a stick in the mud, a fuddy-duddy, maybe too polite, too nice, and he realized there was only one way Way to win these men over and that was to use some profanity <laughs> and it's also worth mentioning he's not a young guy like he graduates from high school in 1901 so by the time we're in the war in 1917 he's mid to late 30s so he's considerably older than yeah. uh, a lot of these guys he's also single which i'm guessing at, in your late 30s at that time is a little bit kind of strange like he's unmarried um and so i can see how he might come across as being a little not exactly like your Cracker Jack soldier, like that you'd want to send to the front at this at this particular moment. Yeah, I think more of them regard him as like a father figure and not in a good way, right? Like more yeah. like a fuddy-duddy, this old, old dude while these guys are all, you know, 19, 20, cutting up, having a good time. But Truman will win them over and he'll resort back to one of the earliest jobs he had out of school, which was working on the railroad. He used to work on the railroad in Missouri. He used to sleep 
like in the hobo cars, uh, chase hobos off the train, sleep in the in the cars, the freight cars, and he picked up a few uh, a few obscenities on that job. So after a few months of dealing with these Battery D guys, he just started letting the foul mouth language fly, and the men were so shocked that this nice kind of unassuming Midwestern gentleman could use <laughs> such language that eventually they started to come around. Truman was very successful in the field. He's credited with saving the lives of an entire division. In 1918, uh, he did this by ignoring the orders of his direct superior who had told him to do one thing. And he said, no, 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 I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna move all my artillery and I'm gonna go here. Um, so he did the right thing. He did the smart thing, he saved lives and yet he was still called to the mat and almost uh, discharged for disobeying those orders. But he, you know, did the right thing. Battery D didn't lose a single man under Truman's command, which in the First World War is pretty remarkable. Yeah, that's a feat. And I mean, he's in France, he's in the Argonne. I mean, he's in places with heavy fire, fire, mm -hmm. uh, firing, heavy, heavy artillery. Um, it's pretty incredible. I think World War I is what's going to put Truman on the trajectory to be president. Not only the connections he makes, some of which are very influential. He's going to uh, meet men who, through um, their networks, their fathers, their, their friends, are going to connect him into the political machine. But more importantly, he learns how to be a leader. He learns how to meet people outside of his small Midwestern town. He meets men who are Catholic. He didn't know Catholics growing up in Missouri. He's going to meet people with different uh, ethnicities, backgrounds. It really broadens his horizons, and I think that's going to be really important. One thing I love about Truman is he remained an active reservist all through his congressional career. So the whole time he's in the Senate, he stayed in the Missouri reserves. Uh, when World War II started, he wanted to leave the Senate and go fight, but President Franklin D. Roosevelt wouldn't let him uh, because FDR preferred that those congressmen keep their seats and stay stateside. Um, but Truman really, really desperately wanted to, and he stayed involved with his American Legion group, with his VFW group, uh, all through the rest of his life. So that was Something he was really, really proud of. And even when he was a senator and a, a president, he always made time to see the men that he served with. And it's something that really defines him going forward. Uh, Rebecca, you were mentioning that he's single when he well. when he's away during World War One. That was definitely not by choice. I think we probably need to talk about this. Yeah, so he's single in the taxes sense like he's not <laughs> married i guess would be the better way to put not that. for lack of trying not for lack of trying and he does have a sweetheart um and harry truman is one of the rare men overall but particularly men in politics who <laughs> really is a super one woman guy. And I don't mean that in the sense of like he got married and, you know, the only once. I mean that he really never looked at another woman other than his wife. Like there's no evidence ever that he like even so much as flirted. Um, he meets his future wife, Vast. They grew up in the same town uh, and they're like childhood sweethearts, which is precious, but also disgusting. Disgusting. Like, oh, really? He says they're, he's six, she's five when they meet. Uh, he says he never loved anyone else. He never even went on a serious date with anyone else in his life. A little reluctant, I think. Um, she kind of dodged his advances for a while. Not, I think, because she had other fellas she was interested in, but because he didn't seem to have too many prospects. And um, so she just kind of dodges him for years. Um, and he's in love with her this whole time. He asked her to marry him several different times and eventually I think he kind of just wears down her resistance uh, more than anything else and they it was a true partnership um, in like the best sense of the term they he consulted her about absolutely everything he treated her as his total equal she was very involved in his um, decisions from the day they got married until the day he died. Yeah, he called her the boss, which I love uh, yeah. because they really were. He respected her opinion, respected her input. Uh, she was involved in everything. Um, he is just, when you read about their courtship, I mean, you almost feel a little bad for him. It's like he writes these letters. Sometimes she just doesn't respond 
respond, you know, where he pours his heart out and she's maybe just like, okay. Um, I definitely think some of it is maybe her waiting to see what his prospects will be. There is also her mother, which is going to be a thorn in the side of their marriage um, for their entire lives. Uh, Bess's father committed suicide when he was eight, when she was 18. So she was left with a mother who was very emotionally fragile, very demanding, had very high expectations for Bess. And even after Truman became a senator and president, Bess's mother would write Bess about men that she had grown up with and what they were doing with their lives, always to just kind of be like, you know, that young gentleman you knew, well, now he's a banker, you know, so something to think about. So like the <laughs> fact that she married the man who becomes president apparently is not good enough. So poor Harry Truman, as much as he loved Bess, I, there was also, I think, this influence of her mother who just never thought he was good enough and didn't think politics was really all that respectable at the end of the day. Um, but I love their relationship. We talk so much about presidents and cheating and yes. adultery and all sorts of affairs. And that's fun as a guide, but as a married lady, I sort of love Harry Truman's devotion to Bess. And I love that they could also be quite amorous underneath it all. Yes. Um, so one of my favorite stories, and I preface this story on my White House at Night tour by saying the following things. First of all, um, this is, uh, Harry Truman is not a president we associate with a lot of scandal, but uh, when he was president, uh, and he's at this point, him and his wife are both in their 60s, and they look like your grandparents. I don't know what your grandparents look like, but they look like Harry and Bess Truman. And um, one, if you've ever been to Washington DC in the summertime, it's very inhospitable and kind of disgusting. And after some number of years in Washington, Bess Truman just can't handle one more summer in this swamp. And so she tells her husband in May, look it, I'm out. I can't. And so she goes traveling around and she stays out of Washington until September. And so she comes back in mid-September. They haven't seen each other in a number of months. And like a good husband, Harry Truman has cleared his schedule the night that she comes back so that he can welcome her home. And they have this very lovely dinner together. And it's just wonderful. And then they leave dinner early. And no one thinks that much of it. Uh, until the next morning when Bess Truman, who, again, I emphasize, looks like your grandmother, uh, she has to find the head gentleman usher at the White House and inform him that somehow, in the middle of the night, mysteriously, the president's bed broke. Now, it's a mystery. It remains unsolved to this day. But somehow, their president had, they had this antique bed, and they actually did share a bed throughout their whole marriage. Uh, and the wooden slats underneath the bed, three of them break in the middle of the night. Those Again, things very, happen, Rebecca. They do, very, yes. So anyway, I don't know, we don't know to this day what happened, but I'll leave it to your imagination to try to guess. This is the point on my tour where a few people will chuckle, but then I always say, but he did it with his own wife, and then everybody laughs. laughs. Because I think that's cute with his own yes. wife. It's so cute. It's so cute. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Bess, I think, as we talk about the White House years. But um, she is a really fascinating kind of pairing to him. Um, as much as he loved politics, as much as he loved Washington, D.C., he enjoyed his time in the nation's capital. She hated it. She was always going back home to Missouri. She hated being in the public eye. Her favorite phrase, according to the Washington press, was no comment, um, <laughs> because that's what she would say. She was very different from the first first lady who preceded her. Now, um, Truman's journey to Congress will be a little bit of a, a roundabout uh, journey. And in typical Truman fashion, he sort of has to struggle to get there. Um, he comes back after World War I, starts a few businesses, but eventually finds his way into being a county judge. He develops really strong support for New Deal policies, which puts him in uh, kind of in the good graces of some of the local Democratic Party leaders in Missouri. Um, and eventually he's going to be appointed the director of the federal reemployment program. So he's going to be down there really uh, implementing FDR's New Deal programs. And in 1934, he runs for the Senate. He is the fifth choice in the Democratic primary. So there are five, four other Democrats. He's one of five Democrats running, all of whom are backed by more powerful political machines than he is. But he is going to win this primary. And he wins this primary because he's the kind of guy 
who joined any club that would have him, went to every, you know, army get together, every veterans party. When he was a county judge, he was going from county seat to county seat. When he was doing this um, federal reemployment program, he was traveling to these little towns and he wins it the old fashioned way by getting out and like, shaking hands and kissing babies. So he wins this primary and then he goes on to defeat his Republican incumbent by almost 20 points. Um, I but love him, that it's like the Oscars. Yeah. Like there's five of them and like the dark horse like splits the vote. A hundred, a hundred percent. And it's, it's again, it's old fashioned politicking that really wins. He is nobody's favorite. And we're going to see this in Truman elections over and over. Uh, so he runs for Congress, uh, gets to the Senate. He's the junior senator from Missouri, yay. Uh, and then in 1940, he gets reelected. So he's very, very popular as a senator. Um, he loves his time in the Senate. But in 1940, um, shortly after that reelection, we're gonna be entering into World War II. He wants to join up. They won't let him, he has to stay back. So he needs something to do. And Truman's a guy who likes activity. So mm -hmm. he decides to form what would become known as the Truman Committee. This committee is gonna be formed specifically to combat waste and profiteering during uh, the Second World War when there were all these big, big government contracts. Uh, when we talk about the Great uh, Depression ending, we tend to kind of say, well, the Great Depression happened and then the New Deal and, and then the Depression ended. Well. No, the yeah. war ends the depression. And a big part of that are these massive, massive contracts. And Rebecca, this will shock you. Just like today, there were people who took advantage of these big government <gasps> contracts no. and were shortchanging the American public and their, their hard earned tax money. I can't imagine that. So Truman, a man who. Which yeah. is by the way, like worth like pausing on, like we have this memory of World War II as being this completely altruistic thing where all Americans kind of come together and to defeat the menace overseas. And it certainly was that, but there was also like, people are still people. The greatest generation are still, there are some people are good people and some people that are trying to profit off of the American public. And there were plenty of people in Congress in the 1940s who had business interests or had business connections in their districts and people awarding contracts to not always the best choice. I'm stunned. I know. That does not happen. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that would happen today. I'm stunned uh, that there's Truman, gambling going though, on in this establishment. <laughs> I think Truman, being one of a handful of men at this point in Congress who doesn't come from an Ivy League background, doesn't come from a successful business background, he has never had a business that was successful outside of that canteen at Fort Sill. Um, he has a distrust of big business. He has a distrust of Wall Street. He's appalled to see the way that these essential products and services are being shortchanged or the ways in which they're being cheated. And he puts together this committee. Initially, FDR and his cabinet hate it. They mm -hmm. hate the fact that they're digging into these contracts. As far as FDR and the cabinet sees it, it's money going into the economy, it's money going towards the war, what does it matter? But the more and more FDR sees what Truman is uncovering, the more and more productive the committee is, even FDR comes around and starts supporting the work of the committee. It was ultimately uh, calculated that Truman saved $15 billion of government funds uh, in all, and, and we're talking 15 billion in 1940s money. And that's, that's what he was able to uncover. And you have to imagine the war is going on, everybody's sending their beloved sons and fathers and brothers off to fight. And then you have this, what seems to be this very honest, um, integrity-driven World War I veteran in the Senate. And he's calling these fat cat businessmen before him. And he says, how do you tell the mother in Kansas or Ohio or California or New York that you put her son in a plane that had aluminum that was half an inch too thin? What would you say to her, sir? So he does this. And he calls these people out and he goes from being a very little known figure to being on the cover of Time Magazine to being in the 1940s, they rated the 10 most respected Americans and he was the only congressman on the list in terms of like, in, like honesty, most trusted Americans. He was, he was up there. So he built this reputation fighting what I think is a really good fight during World War II. Uh, my other favorite thing about his time in the Senate is in addition to fighting the good fight against all this government waste and greed, business greed, uh, he spends time at the Library of Congress. As you do. Um, for those who don't know, Rebecca, do you wanna talk about why the Senate 
gets special, special access. So the Library of Congress is all of our library, American taxpayers, we pay for it. it we all can access it, but it is also Congress's library. And the rest of us normal people can't take books home. We can't take books out like you do at your university or in your hometown. Members of Congress can. And so as a senator, he can take out whatever books he wants for as long as he wants them. There are no late fees when you're a member of Congress. Uh, and so he is, Truman is a man after my own heart big time. He takes aft, out all of these books. He's very sort of... Uh, shy about the fact that he doesn't have a college education. He's surrounded by so many uh, Ivy League degrees and lawyers and things like that. And he really wants to educate himself. He's incredibly curious uh, and very well read. And so he will take books home with him to read. And this is like the best advertisement I can think of to run for Congress. They will let you take as many books as you want. Uh, and so he tells his wife that he can't figure out why everybody isn't doing this, which again is something I can see myself saying. Um, and so he doesn't understand why he's the only senator taking all these books home to sort of educate himself, which is just darling. Yeah, I love this idea of like, you know, 1940, 1941, and he's like, why am I the only person in the Senate who recognizes what an incredible resource this is? Um, I he, he would say later in his life that that was his favorite part of being a senator was the yes. Library of Congress and having, you know, access to world class books and research that he could have never dreamt of being this little bookworm in Missouri with its little tiny local library. So um, you're sort of at this point, I hope you're listening, you're like, that guy should be president. I agree. Um, but his path to the presidency, or the, I should say more specifically the vice presidency, is a bit crazy. So Franklin D. Roosevelt, longest serving president in American history, who would be elected for four terms, um, would serve three full terms. And in those three terms, he has two different vice presidents. So his first vice president was a man named John Garner from Texas. Cactus Jack is what he was called in the press, called Cactus is it really? Jack. really? I yeah. did not know that. <laughs> Cactus Jack. Cactus Jack, Cactus John, um, John Garner from Texas. He said the vice, <laughs> vice presidency was not worth a bucket of warm piss, which I don't know if our producer will have to edit that out. The press would say warm spit, quote unquote, yeah. but he said piss. Um, but Garner gets tired in the 1930s of being the second fiddle. And so um, he's going to run against FDR in 1940. So FDR had his two terms. Garner was like, I did my part. I sat back for two, two terms. I'm running for the presidency, which did not work out for mm. John Garner. Mm. But obviously FDR wasn't going to have Garner run with him. So his next vice president was Henry Wallace of Iowa, um, who I did not know that much about Henry Wallace till I read the Truman biography by David McCullough. And it gets into a little bit um, about FDR's vice presidents. And Wallace is a fascinating figure. He's really one of our first progressives. So, so much of what we think of as the progressive Democratic Party today, so many of these ideas come, uh, are championed by Wallace in the 1940s, 50s, and so on. He was really popular as FDR's vice president, but in the 1940s, he was really, really outspoken against racial, racial segregation in the South. And at this time, Democrats like FDR, they need those Southern Democratic votes. FDR and his friends in the party are getting very nervous about this election in 1944. So Roosevelt's up for his fourth term. We're in the midst of World War II. They cannot risk Roosevelt losing. And so Wallace is going to basically get bumped. Now, it gets tricky because all the party, all the guys in the back room with the cigars and stuff, all the party leadership wants it to either be Truman or Justice uh, William O. Douglas to be vice president. So the party leaders basically force FDR to sign a letter saying it's either got to be Justice Douglas or it's got to be Truman, the most popular guy in the Senate. Those are the only options. But Wallace and uh, Roosevelt actually had a personally close relationship. So Wallace got FDR to send a letter to everybody saying, yeah, look, I signed that other letter, but if I was a convention delegate, I'd be voting for Wallace. <laughs> So this is what Truman kind of gets brought into. 
you know, you've got the party leadership pushing for Truman. Truman is, you know, not really that interested in challenging Wallace, who is a well-respected vice president, who's friendly with FDR. FDR isn't out there saying, I want Harry. And so he doesn't do any campaigning. He goes to the convention completely unsure of what's going to happen. And he becomes the vice presidential candidate. It was dubbed the second Missouri compromise because it was just the only person that all these factions of the party could agree on. What I find interesting is that FDR did have a good relationship with Wallace. He offered him um, any cabinet position he wanted. He took secretary of commerce. Truman kept him on as secretary of commerce, even when he was changing out um, a lot of Roosevelt's cabinet. Um, Truman would say the most important members of his political team when he became president were Eleanor Roosevelt and Henry Wallace. So Wallace's support in those early transition years were really, really important. Uh, That said, Wallace and Truman would eventually fall out. Uh, Wallace is going to run third party in 1948, uh, which is going to be very helpful to Harry S. Truman. (laughs) Oh, I bet it is. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. (laughs) Going to be really helpful. So um, Truman becomes vice president. Uh, Harry uh, Harry S. Truman becomes VP when FDR wins his fourth term. Yay. And then he is one of our shortest serving vice presidents. 82 days. 82 days. Now, um, he knew, like most Democrats, that Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1944 is not in good health, that whoever is going to be VP could very likely become president. Truman didn't realize that it was 82 days. Yeah, I think like it's really kind of interesting and reading about Roosevelt and reading about Truman, you kind of get the sense that like it wasn't a huge secret that Roosevelt was in poor health. Like for example, the fourth inauguration is the only one of FDR's presidential inaugurations that does not take place at the Capitol. He's so sort of ill that they actually do it at the White House. Now, granted, we're in the midst of the war and that's the excuse that they give, you know, to sort of tamp down all the pomp and the the money spending. But if you look at pictures of Roosevelt at Yalta uh, in February of 1945, he's clearly a very sick man that said, I don't think it was clear or made clear rather to Harry Truman just how sick Roosevelt was, probably partly at Roosevelt's own design. Roosevelt didn't want to know how sick he was and sort of was in denial about it. Uh, and so he was really a congestive heart failure. He was had all kinds of things. Uh, he wasn't sleeping very well. It was all very terrible. And they don't meet. That's the other thing that's really kind of twice. interesting. They, they, they meet, meet twice, twice in 82 days. <laughs> Yeah, like he's the vice president. He's a heartbeat away. And they literally, there's one photograph of them at, the, I think, their second meeting. And it's weeks before Roosevelt's death. And you get it's Harry March. Truman. Yeah, he got Harry Truman who looks really happy and he's energized. And he's meeting with the boss. And Roosevelt just looks haggard and like he's coming off a bender. Like, and he's not, but he just looks rough. And it's, um, It's not really great. (laughs) Um, And so Truman's really one of our shortest serving vice presidents uh, because he really literally 82 days. I think what you you say too, it's by Roosevelt's design, but there's so much going on from November 1944 to April 1945 with the war. And Truman is not in these cabinet meetings. Truman is not hearing what's coming from the Department of Defense. He's not getting this information on the war. He has no idea about the Manhattan Project. Um, Roosevelt very purposefully sort of builds this wall. And I can tell you, the American voter in 1944 really had no idea how serious Roosevelt's health was. So Truman sort of goes along with this. He he wants to serve his country. He respects Roosevelt. He sees himself as a true New Deal Democrat. But when he meets with Roosevelt that second time, that's when he writes Bess a, late, a letter and says, this is this is maybe going to happen. I, I think we have to prepare ourselves. Yeah. That's reality. Oh, yeah. And it's one of those things that one of those things that I don't feel like Roosevelt has gotten enough criticism for because he relies so much on his own charm and his own like the fact that he's been in office for so long to sort of shape the post-war world and then all of a sudden he's gone and so harry truman is left like wait what now you know like he's holding the bag so wait what did you tell stalin what did stalin tell you where are we on that so (laughs) yeah how are we going to handle the soviet union no big deal it's fine (laughs) um before we get to the dramatic end of the roosevelt presidency though i have to tell my favorite scandal story (laughs) 
I love involving this Harry S. Truman <laughs> happens while he's vice president. Um, the National Press Club is in downtown DC, just a couple blocks from the White House. Uh, during World War II on Saturdays, it was open to any service member. So service members could come in for free and get beer, sandwiches, hot dogs, and enjoy a little bit of entertaining. Congressmen, politicians uh, were invited to come. The rule was nobody could speak for more than two minutes. So it couldn't be a campaign thing, but a chance for people to come. You know, Truman, he's vice president. He's got nothing to do. He was used to being busy in the Senate, and then he becomes VP, and he is very quickly bored. So mm -hmm. he starts going over the National Press Club on Saturdays. And as we know, he's a talented pianist. So one Saturday he sits down, he's playing the piano. It's very cute. And there's a Hollywood starlet there, 20 year old Lauren Bacall. If you don't know who she is and you don't know what she looked like around 20, Google her um, and go watch some movies immediately. Yes. Uh, Lauren Bacall, I love your work if you're listening. No, I'm just kidding. She, she she's passed very away dead, a few yeah. years ago. She's deceased. Um, but picture this amazingly beautiful yeah. starlet uh, legs for days, just gorgeous. And she's trying to make herself a career. And so she's got a press agent there, you know, back then they, they, they were these, you know, it's, it's a photo op, right? She jumps on top and she's just beaming down at Harry Truman and he's smiling back up playing the piano and every photographer in DC snaps a photo. The Associated Press puts it out. It's in all the newspapers, um, including the newspaper in Missouri, which is where Bess is at the time. <laughs> and she sees this picture and she writes her husband a letter. And she <laughs> says, you are never to play piano in public again. You look like a fool. Love Bess. And that was just it because she was the boss. So he, she just kind of forbids him from playing piano in public again. He almost never did after that point. But what I love about this story is he actually stayed friendly with Lauren Bacall and with her uh, soon-to-be husband, Humphrey Bogart. And the two of them would campaign for Truman when he runs for re-election in 1948. So they're out at this big campaign event in Los Angeles. Uh, actually, young Ronald Reagan, who was still a Democrat at that point, was campaigning for Truman. So that's a fun little, little tidbit. But um, at the time, Bacall was pregnant, and she shared with Truman that they were taking bets on the sex of their baby. And Truman bet Bogart an undetermined amount of money, unknown amount of money, that it was going to be a boy. And sure enough, uh, it was Humphrey Bogart Jr. It was a little Mr. Bogart. So Humphrey Bogart sent a check to the President of the United States uh, for the money he owed from the bet. And he actually wrote this great note. Would appreciate it if you endorse it and cash it so I may frame it for my son, who will undoubtedly run for president on the Democratic ticket in 1999, unless you still hold the office. Which is great. Bo Bogey was a Democrat. I'll just put that out there. Uh, Truman very kindly does return the check. He says, I am returning the check which you sent me endorsed to Mr. Bogart Jr. I hope you will buy him a savings bond with it and put it in his educational fund with my compliments. It is a rare instance when I find a man who remembers his commitments and meets them on the dot. Uh, so the two of them stayed friendly actually throughout the rest of Bogart's life, Truman would outlive Humphrey Bogart. So a little bit of frivolity before we get to April 12th. April 12th, 1945, Truman was up on the hill. He was VP. He had been, uh, you know, running the Senate. He'd been chairing the Senate session. He had adjourned. He was going to Sam Rayburn's office for a drink because that's what you do when you were spending time with Sam Rayburn. And sure. as he's getting into Rayburn's office, there's a message for him to come to the White House immediately. He gets there. It's Eleanor. It's Roosevelt's closest advisors. And Eleanor tells him that Franklin D. Roosevelt has passed away at Warm Springs, Georgia. And of course, Truman, the kind, sweet man that he is, asks if there's anything that he can do for her. And she says, is there anything we can do for you? For you are the one in trouble now. So he's sworn in um, 7.09 p.m. that night in the West Wing. And he's thrown in at this really incredible moment. The United States is within days uh, of, of really beating the Germans, right, winning on uh, the front, the Atlantic side of this war. Um, we're within days of the death of Hitler. Um, so there's this great momentum, right, in Europe. Uh, and just a few weeks later, on May 8th, it will be victory in Europe. So on his 61st birthday, 
Truman gets to announce that the United States has won the war in Europe, which mm -hmm. is great, except now you got to figure out what to do about Japan. Now you got to figure out what to do with the Soviet Union. And Truman is, I think, thrown in, like you were saying, Rebecca, without the benefit of having any idea of what Roosevelt was working on, what mm -hmm. his plans were. Truman tries to keep Roosevelt's advisors around, tries to keep Roosevelt's cabinet. But a lot of these people are loyal to Roosevelt. A lot of them come from Roosevelt's background, mm -hmm. very Ivy League, very private school, very, you know, East Coast elitist. Uh, and Truman's not part of that world. And so there's this suspicion about Truman. There's this sense that he doesn't understand how these things work. Um, so he isn't always given, I think, the best introduction in those first few months because people are hesitant. They're hesitant to trust him. Uh, it is not until almost the end of July that he's told about the Manhattan Project. So even after he becomes president, there's this secrecy surrounding this weapon that the United States has been developing. And just for context, we dropped the first bomb on Hiroshima on August 6th. So he's not told about this until literally days before, like, until we've had a successful test in uh, Almogordo, New Mexico, um, in mid-July. So he's not told about this for months after he's president. And now suddenly he's faced with, this is it. This is the, the decision. And uh, it, you could almost do an entire, I think, podcast episode about the decision to drop the atomic bomb. I wrote um, a whole paper about it in college. Yes. Uh, these, these are big ethical issues. There's huge issues about diplomacy. I mean, there's a lot of, of debate here. Uh, it's something I talk about with my students a lot on student tours, because I often talk about how fond I am of Truman, especially at the Library of Congress. And a lot of students question, I think rightfully, right, the decision to drop, drop the, the bomb and to do what he does. But I always remind them that he had to make a decision in a matter of weeks, not even really days, while someone like Franklin D. Roosevelt had had years and months to contemplate, can we do this? If we can, would I do it? What would be the situation? And so whether people agree or disagree with Truman's decision, and I think there are very valid points on either side, Truman is really thrown off the deep end when it comes to really helping America in this war and trying to end it with as little loss of life everywhere as as he can. Truman's uh, time in the White House is sort of fascinating to me. Uh, Truman is like, you know, he's thrown into this presidency. He's got the war. The war ends. Huzzah. The war ends, 1945. Then there's immediately all these issues, right? Uh, there's work strikes. There's the GI Bill, which is uh, turning into a total mess, which, of course, people are corrupting. And then he's looking around the White House, and he's like, is it me? Or is this building, like, kind of in disarray? Like, there's plaster falling off the wall. There's cracks going up the ceiling. Uh, he and Bess have one daughter, Margaret, uh, who will live with them at, at times in the White House. She had a piano in her room because she was training to be a concert singer. And, uh, you know, you have a piano in the room, except that the leg of the piano went through the floor and into the ceiling of the family dining room. <laughs> So they're dealing with this building that they really hate. He called it the Great White Prison. Yes, the crown jewel of the federal penal uh, system. <laughs> That's great. Uh, because not only was, it, was he sort of kept, you know, his routine cramped down, but also because it was just in really, really terrible repair. Um, he has to run for re-election, though, in 1948. He has finished out most of FDR's term, but he wants to win one on his own. He wants to prove that Truman is a man who can win the presidency. He wants to run for re-election, but he's nervous. Um, there's a lot going on in the post-war America. Um, there's still a lot of economic uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding foreign policy. Truman is being challenged by Wallace, uh, FDR's former vice president, who's much more progressive than Truman, particularly in the South, where we're talking about uh, racial segregation at this time, he's um, being challenged on the Republican side by Thomas Dewey. There's concern that Dwight D. Eisenhower might run, and there is no one more popular in 1948 America than Dwight D. Eisenhower. Truman, actually, at one point, we discovered from a diary just discovered about 15 years ago, that he was seriously considering asking Eisenhower to run in 48, and Truman would go back to being vice president. That's how desperate oh, wow. Truman was getting and how concerned he was about Eisenhower. Oh, wow. But Truman goes to run, 
And he runs the way he ran when he was running for the Senate the first time. He travels. He talks to everyday Americans. He talks to the concerns of not just the people with lots of money in the bank or people with plenty of success and, and stuff in their future. He talks to the people who are still frightened, the people who uh, got a hand up from the New Deal but now aren't sure what's going to happen as things are moving forward. Everybody writes him off. Nobody thinks he's going to win. There's the famous photo, right? <laughs> Truman holding the newspaper mm -hmm. um, because Truman wins. He wins resoundingly. He wins the popular votes and the Electoral College. So this is not even one of those where he manages to sort of sneak his way in. He wins an overwhelming success. I think part of that due to uh, Wallace and his third party run, but mm -hmm. also due to the fact that people underestimated the appeal of Truman. And I think they underestimated that for so many Americans still, he was trustworthy. He was honest. And, you know, the buck stops here. That was Harry S. Truman. Uh, this idea, right, that whether people, you know, Dropping the mom is a big decision. You know, deciding whether or not to, to enter into war in Korea, these are big, big decisions. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, Harry S. Truman never said, I blame this guy. I got bad advice. This was someone's recommendation. This was a, a Roosevelt policy. He always took the blame and he, he, he owned took it upon himself. He owned Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I think that in 1948, the American voter was like, cool. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Sounds good to me. So then he wins re-election and he's like, oh yeah, by the way, the White House is falling apart. We got to rebuild it. Bye. So he <laughs> and his family move out and he's going to live almost his entire second term, um, three and a half years in the Blair House, which is across the street. So if you take our White House at night tour, uh, take some of our other tours that are in that uh, Lafayette Square Park area, we usually point out the Blair House. So it's just right across the street. Uh, while he lives in the Blair House, he sort of loves it um, initially because he can walk uh, up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, talk to people, it's really great, uh, until he is targeted for an assassination attempt. So uh, November 1st, 1950, uh, Truman is living at the Blair House as he has been for almost two years at this point. There is a very strong um, nationalist movement that's been uh, building steam in Puerto Rico. Uh, Truman had made uh, sort of dismissive remarks uh, to the press about the movement that he didn't think much of it, didn't think it was going to be uh, that big a deal. Two Puerto Rican nationalists had taken offense to this. Oscar Colombo and Grazilio Torresola. Um, Very nice. Thank you. A lot, of, a lot of L's in there, L's and R's. I was going to say, I'm going to set the scene for everybody. Yeah. November 1st is generally not a particularly warm time in Washington, but that day happens to be quite warm. It's in the upper 70s, and this is com comes into play. Truman is back at Blair House in between meetings. And it's a long day. It's a hot day. There's no air conditioning because it's November. And so he takes off his jacket, loosens his tie, and he's going to lay on the bed, open the windows, and he's going to lay on the bed in his bedroom and just kind of zone out for a few minutes. And that's when these two Puerto Rican nationalists come down Pennsylvania Avenue and it was a street back then. So there were cars and they're walking between the cars and they approach the entrance to Blair house and shots ring out. And I'll let you go into a little more detail, but my favorite part about this, and I mentioned this on tours is the difference between me and Harry Truman. It is if I hear gunshots. I run in the other direction. Harry Truman runs toward the open window and sticks his head out over the street. So he's kind of like watching what's going on, which is obviously not really great when people are trying to kill you. So uh, I sort of love, if you read um, books about Secret Service in this time, they talk about how the Roosevelt years were so easy because Roosevelt, um, unable to walk unassisted in a wheelchair, this wasn't a guy who was going anywhere quick, uh, but Truman was ex quite fit. He was an active man. He liked to get out among the people. And when he heard gunshots, he ran to the freaking window. Um, you can imagine the Secret Service agents in this room just yelling, get down, get down. Uh, Truman would say later that he wasn't at all afraid because in World War I, he'd had professionals shoot at him. <laughs> which is sort of a great way to respond to this. But to help people understand this, because it's amazing to me how few people realize there was an assassination attempt. Uh, these two gunmen approach from the West. So that would be from 17th Street um, today if you were sort of outside. Um, Torres Sola is actually just going to come up to a guard booth. Uh, there's a man inside named Leslie Kofelt. Kofelt has his back to him, and Torres Sola is just going to open fire. So this is really cold-blooded murder on the street. Uh, he's going to fire four shots. Kofelt's going to be struck three times. 
Uh, Torsel is then going to shoot another man, Joseph Downs, uh, but Downs is going to manage to still get his way to the door and secure the entrance. So Secret Service is doing exactly what they're trained to do. Um, Colazzo, who goes up to a Secret Service officer named Donald Birdsdell, he forgot to put a uh, load uh, around in the chamber. So when he goes to fire, the gun doesn't fire. So this buys uh, Birdsdell a little bit of time to start to get away, but Colazzo will shoot him again. Um, Torres Solo, though, is going to be the one who really inflicts the most damage. He's going to get shots fired off into just about every one of the men involved. During this gunfight, uh, which is the largest gunfight in Secret Service history, Kofelt is going to prop himself up from the guard booth. He's going to fire one shot, and he's going to get Torresola two inches below his ear and kill him instantly. Colazzo will be apprehended. So this is all over in 38 seconds. So it happens very, very quickly. These men do exactly what they're trained to do. That said, Kofelt had been uh, shot three times in the chest and abdomen. He's going to be rushed to the hospital. He's going to die four hours later. Makes Leslie Kofelt very unique. He is, yes. First of all, he is buried at Arlington Cemetery, and he's the only Secret Service agent in history to be killed while protecting the President of the United States. Uh, we've only ever had four Secret Service agents take a bullet for the president, and three of them do so for Harry Truman. So it's Kofelt and then Downs and Birdsell. Uh, the we've other already one, talked about the other one. Yeah, Tim McCarthy, right, <laughs> for the Reagan assassination, right? J uh, yeah, Tim McCarthy, yep. Yeah, so um, if you listen to our uh, podcast about the attempt on Reagan's life, that's the other. But I think the Reagan one gets more attention. We don't always talk about this. Uh, what's amazing to me is Truman writes his cousin, and he's sort of like, you know, he's sad. He's heartbroken, actually, um, about Kofeld's death. He calls it a murder. He, he believes that, that they, they shot him in the back, like what gentleman does that, what, what person does that. But he then feels that they really tighten the security around him, that Truman sort of doesn't understand why he can't go out by himself, <laughs> why he can't go take a walk anymore, why they didn't want him by the window. Uh, so he sort of struggles with the tightened security that's going to uh, happen around here. Uh, one of my other favorite things with Truman during his presidency is his relationship with his daughter, Margaret. Margaret Truman, if you aren't aware, uh, just passed away uh, in the early 2000s. She was a prolific author. She wrote a number of DC set murder mysteries and a number of nonfiction books about growing up in the White House, about being a first daughter, uh, kind of an inside look into the residence. She was one of the first, first children to do that, to really kind of talk a little bit. And he was very fond of his daughter, uh, part of the uh, kind of expansion of the Truman balcony uh, that they do on the White House is so he and Margaret can have space to sit out and enjoy the view of the National Mall. And, you know, Margaret, during this time, is a young woman. She's trying to become a, a concert singer, trying to have this musical career. And she gives a concert in DC. And the <laughs> music critic for the Washington Post, Paul Hume, he goes, and he writes a pretty scathing review. He, Margaret was very earnest, but it doesn't appear that she had the talent really to become a concert singer, at least not at the level that she wanted to be. And so this review really stings her and it really her father, of course, as a lot of dads are, he thinks that his daughter can do no wrong. And Harry Truman has zero chill about this situation. He gets very upset uh, about this negative review about his little girl and just fumes about it, um, which I think is like adorably human and very dad-like. Yeah, but then as president of the United States, he writes a letter to the critic yeah. saying, if we meet in person, you will need a new nose and a lot of beef steak for black eyes. So um, <laughs> that gets into the press because he writes it to a reporter, to a music critic. Of course, the Washington Post publishes this letter. It's really embarrassing for Truman. Um, he will defend himself. Again, the buck stops here. He says, look, I wrote this as a dad. I did what any dad would do. Mm -hmm. um, I did this as a private citizen. But that said, the president sending a letter like that to the Washington Post. Um, it's probably not great. It stayed in the news cycle for a while. <laughs> um, Truman really is, we're talking about him sort of fuming. He was like in a pretty incredible physical shape. I don't think we appreciate uh, Truman's commitment to his health. He had a morning routine that I deeply try to emulate. Uh, he started every morning with a large shot of bourbon, usually wild turkey or old granddad. Just uh, a As little bit do. of an old fashioned uh, brand now. Uh, he'd have big shot of bourbon, large glass of orange juice, 
uh, for the acidity. Then he would take a brisk walk. His ideal was two miles, uh, and he liked to walk at a pace of at least 120 steps per minute, and he would time himself to make sure he was keeping his pace. Uh, when he was a senator, he used to just walk from the home that his family was renting, uh, kind of close to DuPont Circle. He would just walk from there down to Capitol Hill, and that was his morning walk. Uh, then when he was vice president and then president, uh, he would try to just walk around the, the, the Lafayette Square neighborhood. Um, but he really, really believed in walking every day. He lived to be 88, so that is a really good, I think, Doing something right to keep. Um, he was not a picky eater. He would eat just about everything. Then again, you probably could make an argument that it wasn't the walking, but in fact, the whisk, the bourbon that was helping him live a long life. I, I feel think you like need you'd... both. You need the bourbon and then a brisk walk. Yeah, I agree. Let's implement that. <laughs> um, they also, I think, were, were fans of bourbon in the evenings as well. So you really need the morning and evening bourbon. Obviously, yes. Um, he was not a picky eater. He said that his time in, his arm, in the army taught him very quickly that if you complained about the food, they would make you cook it. So he would eat what he was given. But he was a bit obsessive about his weight. Um, he would not eat bread other than toast in the morning. He was really um, specific about eating vegetables and about eating fruit. Not too many sweets, not too many heavy foods. He bragged when he left the White House that he could still wear suits that he bought in 1935. So he was really proud of himself for not uh, indulging in the sort of rich lifestyle of many of the men of Washington with these big, heavy meals and constant kind of uh, dining and extravagance. Um, what I think is kind of cute, too, is as much as he was very, like, specific about what he ate, he actually was really worried about Margaret and that she was too skinny. And he wrote several letters to his cousins that he worried about diet culture, essentially, and worried about the impact on young women. So I think it was sort of sweet that he recognized, like, a little ahead of his time, eating healthy, not overindulging, but also making sure that these women weren't getting crazy ideas and, and skipping meals. Now, um, despite all of this, when you hear, I think, about Truman as a person, his personality and what he was like, it's hard to believe, but when he leaves office in 1952, he is one of the most unpopular presidents of the United States period. There's several reasons for that. There's the continued sort of rise of Eisenhower. People just really desperately want Eisenhower to be president of the United States. There's MacArthur, who has become this thorn in Truman's side, criticizing Truman publicly and really kind of turning the press uh, against Truman. There is the entry into war in Korea, um, which is something that will ultimately be, I think, a downfall for Truman's presidency. So he leaves office with a 22% approval rating. That is an all-time low that is matched only by Nixon in January of 1974. So Nixon as Watergate is at its like zenith. That's how bad it is. Wow. So that's, but that's 1952. 20 years later, within 20 years, Truman is going to be considered one of our, our greatest presidents. And it makes sense. If you start to think about where we are with the Nixon presidency, that distrust in the government, Watergate, the Pentagon Papers, the Vietnam War, you start to see this, this cynicism in government. You start to see this corruption. People in the 1970s remembered Truman, and they remembered that integrity, that honesty. And so I think historians in particular started saying, wait a second, maybe he got a bad shake. Maybe um, some of his thoughts on the Soviet Union were not wrong. Maybe he had, was a little ahead of his time in terms of how to deal with what they thought of as kind of the Soviet threat. So we see a turnaround in his legacy while he's still alive, which is really unusual for presidents. Usually you have to die before people yeah. start to appreciate you again. But in his lifetime, people became nostalgic. And I think a lot of that is because to the end, he took responsibility. He, he mm -hmm. was, you know... The buck stops here, Harry, and I'm going to try to do my best. And he really was one of the hardest working presidents. Um, he put in the work. He wasn't there to go to fancy dinners. He wasn't there to hobnob with celebrities. He was there to try to work for the American people and help the average American have a better life. Of course, he gets out of, uh, he gets out of the presidency, and uh, he and Bess go back to Missouri. And Bess is like, so what are we going to do about money? Because back then, there was no pension if right. you served in the Senate. 
there was no pension if you were president. Uh, so the only money Truman was getting after 1952 was his army pension, which was a hundred and twelve dollars a month back then. So maybe like a thousand dollars a month today. Oh. That was it. And when he was president, he started making seventy five thousand a year. It capped out and uh, went up when he was president to a hundred thousand a year. But that's like a quarter of what a president makes today. Um, so it's considerably less. So he had no real money. And when he leaves the White House, he makes a promise, a commitment that he sticks to. He will not take a corporate job. He will not serve on a board. He won't do commercials. He won't do any commercial enterprise, real estate, investment. He doesn't want to do anything that would cheapen what being president means. That sounds so nice. And it's it's not an easy thing to do, right? You know, this oh, is a yeah. man who isn't wealthy, who mm -hmm. needs money, that at this point, right, there's no kind of um, anything being provided by the government, but he doesn't want people to give him money just because he was president. He doesn't want people taking advantage of that position. And so he really believes in going back to being a citizen, a true citizen, unbossed and unbought kind of, which I love um, to, to throw to Shirley Chisholm. Shout out Shirley moment. Chisholm. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only problem with this is he's got no money. So he has to sell. Luckily, he has a little family property he sells. He agrees to a book deal because he figures a book is a reasonable way to use his name. Uh, the book deal eases some of this, but it gets to be such a kind of public embarrassment, this idea that this president has no money, that Congress will pass the former President's Act, which provides the first presidential pensions, $25,000 a year. At the time, there were only two living former presidents, Herbert Hoover, who was a millionaire and had made plenty of money, and Truman. Uh, Hoover took the money, even though he didn't want it or need it, and he said later he would just donate it to charity, but he took it so that um, Truman could take it and everybody could look even. Uh, so Hoover didn't want to embarrass Truman by turning it down. That's kind of nice of Hoover. So actually. that's one nice thing I will say about Herbert Hoover. So um, Truman uh, ends his presidency in 1952, but he lives another 20 years. So let's talk about how he spends those 20 years. First of all, what would you do, Rebecca? You're retired. You got no other jobs. You got nothing but time. What would you do? What would you and Craig do? I would travel and read. Yeah, so that's what Truman does. Truman and Bess, <laughs> uh, Harry and Bess go on a road trip. 1953. They leave Independence, Missouri in their Chrysler New Yorker, and they go driving around the country. Truman said, traveling is basically the only recreation I have besides reading, so why not? He figured this was a good way to blend back into normal society. So 1953, there's no Secret Service protection for former presidents, no bodyguards, no nobody. So it's just the two of them. They think that they can just go places and it's going to be normal. Oh, but it's not. Nope. He's Harry S. Truman. He's pretty famous. Um, but what's so wonderful to me is like everywhere they go, there's these well-wishers. People want to talk to them. The press starts showing up because they're like, uh, the Trumans are staying at this roadside motel. So a lot of times they'd check in and then in the morning when they were leaving, the press would be there. And Truman couldn't help himself. He would talk, talk to the press, talk to everybody. Um, but they traveled on the cheap. He didn't have that much money. So they were staying in cheap motels. They were staying with friends. They were eating at, you know, roadside diners and, and eating, you know, sharing entrees to save money. So very, very low key. He pumped the gas himself. He changed the oil himself every 1,000 miles. And he even got pulled over in Pennsylvania. Not for speeding. Uh, apparently, when he was in the White House for so long, for eight years, uh, he'd forgotten a little bit about driving. And he was driving too slow. And there was a state trooper who noticed this line of cars all clogged behind this Chrysler New Yorker. So the trooper pulls him over, goes up to the window, and then is like, oh. Oh, hi. I, I know who you are. You look familiar to me. <laughs> so this trooper was sort of like stuck with like, what am I going to do now? So he basically just let him off with a warning. Truman wrote later, he was convinced the trooper just stopped him to get a handshake. That was why. Oh, yeah, it must be. But the trooper said it was because he was going like 20 miles <laughs> under the speed limit. Uh, but they went on this road trip, which I think is just really, really sweet. This idea of like, they were probably the last president and first lady who would ever get a chance to do something like that, sure. where you could connect yeah. with 
the everyday American where you wouldn't have the paparazzi, um, you wouldn't have that incessant obsession. Um, you know, I don't think that's something that the Bushes or the Obamas could do. It's just not possible today. But then when he gets back from his road trip and once he gets a little bit of money, he turns his attention to his presidential library, which um, I think is really significant because the presidential library idea was really new. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt had established the first presidential library at Hyde Park. Roosevelt was a man uh, with wealth and means. He knew that he had this property that he could just donate, essentially convert into a museum and a library. He had money that he could spend on it, money he could raise. Truman really wants a library. He thinks it's really important, but there was no government funding for a presidential library. So Truman just gets out there. He fundraises. He goes to the American Legion and the VFW, and he goes to the Masons and the Lions Club and all these things he's been a part of and raises money for his presidential library. He raises all the money, and then he agrees to donate it to the government. This is a big deal because there was no legislation that made him do this. Uh, he does it of his own accord, and he's the one who really pushes for the 1955 Presidential Libraries Act, which starts to establish what we have today. He also would push um, Congress to fund organizing and archiving presidential papers, which he considered to be one of his most important contributions because he thought it was significant and important that these presidential documents be saved for future researchers sure. and future students. Um, We're very thankful. <laughs> very, very thankful. Uh, he was deeply involved with the work on his library. He went over all, I mean, he wanted to design it himself, even though he was not a trained architect. So he worked very, very closely with um, both the architects that were involved in the project. Uh, and then when it opened, Truman was like, okay, I work here now. Like, this is, this is my job. <laughs> so, you know, presidents, ex-presidents usually have an office. He had been renting like an office building. And then when the library was opened, he was like, no, my office is here now. So he would be in the library five or six days a week, usually every day but Sunday. He would work the front desk. He would greet visitors. So like you would go to see the Truman Library and then you'd see the sweet little old man at the desk and then you'd be like, wait, huh, wait a minute. <laughs> I noticed, I know those glasses. That's that Harry S. Truman. Like Harry S. Truman. <laughs> he trained all the docents and staff on the library. He would meet student groups and hold press conferences and let them ask questions. Um, it was really a passion of his. I think that childhood loving history, loving reading, you know, that interest in government and history, he really felt that it was important that yeah. we were establishing this. And I think we take presidential libraries a little bit more for granted now, but really, you know, FDR did it. There was no obligation for Truman who didn't have FDR's resource, land, any of that uh, to continue this. But Truman once again saw the importance and the significance. Uh, I just I just love the relationship too that he had with the former presidents. Uh, he would stay friendly with the Kennedys, with the Johnsons. Uh, when Johnson signs Medicare into law, he does it at the Truman Library and the first two Medicare cards that were ever awarded were awarded to Harry and Bess Truman, which I think is just really, really sweet. Uh, Truman celebrated his 80th birthday in 1964. There was a big party for him in Washington, D.C. He was invited actually uh, to the Senate and he was granted the privilege of the floor. He's the first former president to be granted the privilege of the floor at the Senate uh, to a vast standing ovation and much, much um, reveling. Do. Much ado uh, for Truman. Uh, Truman passes away December 1972 at the age of 88, which is incredible. When I think about what Truman lived through in his lifetime, graduating high school in 1901, living through two world wars, living through um, many, many presidencies, this depression, um, and 20 years of those are after his presidency. It's really, mm -hmm. really incredible. Um, he attends so many other presidents' funerals. It's sort of crazy uh, mm. how many presidents die at the same time. Uh, and then Bess lives even longer. She lives to be 97. She died in 1982. Um, she, was, she is still our longest lived first lady. A lot of people think it's Barbara Bush. Nope. Um, but it's, it's Bess Truman, 97. That's incredible. It's incredible. So that, that is Harry S. Truman. I, there's obviously, I think you could do, and we really skimmed over talking about the end of World War II, 
the decision to drop the atomic bomb. Certainly, I think the Korean War should be its own episode to really talk in depth. But I think Truman represents a turning point uh, in the American presidency, in the United States, in the country. He's such a great example, I think, of that silent generation in some ways, or even, I guess, whatever you would say before. But these these people who had to work hard, uh, yeah. who didn't come from privileged backgrounds, who served their country in World War I, many of them again in World War II, who believed in public service, who believed in the community, who believed in the greater good. Um, Truman brings such integrity to the office of the presidency. He brings such an incredible outlook. Um, I, I really love that. And he gets, and this isn't all just because of who he is, he gets sort of the benefit of getting to be this last sort of citizen president before we have the rise of the news uh, cycle and celebrity that we start to get um, in the later 1950s and the 1960s, um, before we have this sort of breakdown in optimism and, and this growth of cynicism. So he just represents such an important point to me. Yes. And he's so, it could have easily gone the other way. I feel like, you know, after great presidents, we don't always have, the next president isn't always as great. After Lincoln, we have Andrew Johnson. Uh, after Washington, we have John Adams, who is sort of much maligned, um, you know, and- Unfairly maligned, unfairly Rebecca says. Maligned. Rebecca I, says. <laughs> I agree. I'm, okay. I'm a John Adams stan. I agree. Um, but like, you know, Truman really- gets thrown into almost an impossible situation. And I don't think there's any other president or leader in American history who could have done a better job than he does of sort of making sense of the moment and uh, managing to continue on. And it's really sort of a testament to him and how that we don't fall apart when FDR dies and that he's able to sort of channel the grief that Americans feel for Roosevelt uh, into sort of uh, dealing with the end of the war and the Marshall Plan and sort of figuring out how we're going to proceed uh, after this massive cataclysm of World War II. And I really think it's almost to his credit that at the end of the day, he doesn't care what his approval rating is. He doesn't care what the polls are saying. Uh, he sort of knows in 1948, even though he could technically have run again, I'm sorry, in 1952, he knows he could have technically run again, um, but he sort of knows it's time to move on. Um, but he makes decisions based on what he knows is right, based on what is good for the country, and whether or not he's going to get good press on it. He doesn't really seem to care whether or not it's going to hurt his approval rating. And it means he leaves office with that terrible approval. But today he's often ranked in the top 10 of yes. our, our best presidents. Uh, he's very well regarded in many, in many ways. And so I think that ability to do what's right, sort of poll numbers and press coverage be damned yeah. is really unique because I don't know if I could not care. Right. And even his predecessor was super interested in polls. FDR was super responsive to the press and he courted the press in a big, big way. Um, and so for Truman to just kind of shove all that to the side and say, all right, I got real work to be done, um, really, I think, says a lot about how he was and who he was. So on May 8th, uh, when, you're, when you're listening to this on May 8th, glass of bourbon, toast to Harry S. Truman. Also to you, Becca. Oh, sure. and to me, yes. <laughs> may may I live to enjoy 88 years, much like Harry S. Right. Truman. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And if you found us because you like World War II history, keep listening for more as we chat about American history and Washington, D.C. sites as they relate to the 75th anniversary of VE Day on May 8th. So Washington, D.C. has some incredible World War II history, and hopefully you will come and visit us and take one of our tours through D.C. by foot. Becca, Rebecca, Dan, and myself, Candon, are all tour guides with D.C. by foot, offering what we think are the best tours in the city. We have tours for tourists and locals alike, so you can find out more at dcbyfoot.com. If you want a sneak peek about what's coming up, you can sign up to our Patreon, Tour Guide Tell All, a few dollars a month will get you early access to all of our podcasts. So thanks for listening and see you next week.